Hey everyone, the name is Eric Thor and the topic of today's video is the INFJ's Enneagram Archetypes. How will INFJ come off in different situations? How is an INFJ in a position of power compared to an INFJ in love? How is an INFJ going to act if they are trying to be performers? If they're trying to be the best compared to an INFJ that is trying to, for example, be a helper or to be a nurturing and caregiving type? Now, as I was figuring this out, I started studying the Enneagram and Jung's 12 archetypes, studying the ruler, studying the magician, studying the performer and their drives and how they come off and what they try to do. I found out that performers were likely to tap on certain letters, in particular for the INFJ, the feeling and the judging, at the expense of their introversion and their intuition. Now, if you didn't notice, the Enneagram is a system of archetypes, archetypes that we draw power from, because we feel often that who we are as we are is not enough. And we early in age start internalizing this idea that who I am right now is not enough. And we use these Enneagram types, we step into these archetypes, we come off like this because we are trying to draw power from something, an archetypal figure, an image in our head of the strong ruler or the nurturing caregiver or the high achieving performer, the successful performer or the kind lover who has intense and meaningful connection. Yeah, these archetypes are meant to guide us through trauma and it gives us a kind of quest, a life quest to fulfill ourselves, to become individuated and to reclaim ourselves. Sometimes, however, these archetypes lead us away from ourselves. They make us be and resemble something we are not. And that's the whole point of this theory of pluses and minuses. The pluses and minuses map out which letters you use and which letters that you don't use or don't use enough. The minuses are things that each Enneagram type has begun to repress in themselves. And having more pluses is not necessarily positive here. Because often, for an 8, the repression of introversion is bigger than, for example, in a 4, where the repression of introversion, intuition and feeling is more mild and gentle. The core is not how many pluses you have. The core is how attached and fixated you are on being a certain person, something you are not, something which brings you stress and anxiety and pain. And so following this theory, these are the differences depending on which center you are in. Note how the 2, 3 and 4 all have strong judging and notice how they also have weak intuition. Notice how the 5, 6 and 7 all have strong introversion. And notice how they at the same time have weak feeling. And realize what a gold mine this is. For example, it allows us to track what an INFJ will be like in a position of power. It shows that the INFJ in power in the 8th Enneagram type is typically going to resemble an ENFJ rather than an INFJ. And there's lots of political INFJs and leader INFJs that have this ENFJ persona. This interpersonal INFJ rather than the typical INFJ. Now what happens when an INFJ steps into the shoes of a reformer? Well, first it becomes that the INFJ becomes fascinated with vision. They've seen themselves doing something impossible and now all they can think of is this vision. They're going over this vision over and over. They're seeing themselves win over and over. They're seeing themselves breaking a record. They're seeing themselves doing something previously thought to be impossible. They're considering a vision that of themselves and they're repeatedly frustrated all the time because they are never really living up to this vision. They're never as fast as they want to be. They're never as good as they want to be. They never hit that high in reality. When an INFJ is trying to translate this high ideal into reality, this is very difficult to them because they will, all they will keep seeing and comparing themselves how they see it in their head compared to reality. But beyond this, the INFJ one has one core issue that they're dealing with and that is putting on this high armor to become this person the INFJ1 believes they need to hide away their sensitivities and vulnerability. They don't allow themselves to feel, they don't allow themselves to dwell on how they feel. They detach and numb themselves from their emotions and their anxiety. They don't feel their anxiety at all. 
They only feel that thirst for victory and that's all they care about, that thirst for victory. And they are very persevering types. They will keep enduring whatever hardships are necessary to succeed in this vision. And the INFJ-1 archetype helps the INFJ cope in working towards a vision that is difficult to realize. And when the INFJ channels the 2, rather, what tends to happen is that the INFJ tends to, to one extent, stop themselves from looking at things they know to be true. They stop themselves from considering things that are generally obvious. And that's why often people say that INFJ 2s or 2s in general are self-deceptive types or ignorant types in the sense that they are ignorant often to what other people need and what other people think. They are so interested in being the helper, being the good guy, being the caregiving, nurturing type that they don't even realize that other people don't want their help or want or need what they are offering. The ISFJ, INFJ, the INFJ2 is trying to give what they think other people need based on what they've thought that other people might want or what other people need to be happy. And they are so in line with this. They are only trying to help. They're only trying to give advice. They've seen what you need. They see and understand you. And they think they understand you at least. And they are trying to give this, but they become disappointed when other people don't want it, when other people don't take it, and when other people don't allow the INFJ to help them. The INFJ3 wants success, and to get success, they believe they have to go outside their comfort zone. They have to put themselves in situations that scare them, or situations that are difficult to handle. And so the INFJ3 is in this constant state of overwhelm, channeling this ESFJ archetype. They're putting themselves on stage, they're being in a certain way to attract attention and to gain popularity. And this is overwhelming to maintain, this overwhelms them, to be like this overwhelms them. It takes so much energy to maintain this. And at the same time, this INFJ believes they have to be so accommodating. As performers, they always have to accommodate other people's needs. They have to be the interpersonal type. They have to be engaged and communicative and networking. They have to constantly be on for others. They have to give other people their energy. And they, in this, they believe they are serving other people. INFJs as performers, as high performers, channel this ESFJ persona because that's what they think other people will like. That's what other people will find anno enjoying. Now, when the INFJ is channeling the four, which is the kind of defensive strategy to shame and to the heart, when you're trying to protect your heart and what you value and who you are, you step into the shoes of an individualist and you're trying to protect yourself by putting on this strong front that will scare other people away. The INFJ four is trying to kind of put on this image of not needing anyone. They are strong, they are independent, they don't need any help. Nobody, they don't share their vulnerabilities with other people. They hide away their insecurities and vulnerabilities. They don't show themselves and how they struggle. They show themselves as people that are always on, intense in a sense, because they are always full of energy. They're always pushing so much energy out, uh, energy that it's really difficult to push out. And they are in many ways uh, doing all of this to push people away. I have so much energy, I don't need your energy. I have so much power, I'm so good, I don't need anyone's help. That's the INFJ4. And the social type, just like the 4 and the 3, is also all about pushing out this high energy. Pushing out this intense kind of um, persona. And what you'll find is... Uh, they all want a lot of attention. They want other people to see them and to look at them, to see how self-sufficient they are, to see how good they are, to see how entertaining they are and how energetic they are. But often this front does not exist. If you go behind the stages, that's not how they are. But in social situations, when an INFJ is just trying to fit in, they believe they have to be like ESFPs. When an INFJ is only trying to fit in, they are trying to channel this interpersonal, this high energy ESFP mode. They're being overly accommodating to other people. They are being, and they force themselves into the roles of listeners. Typically, INFJs are highly communicative. They're all about influencing other people, sharing and expressing their voice. But the INFJ SO silences their own voice. 
silences and reins in their own voice. They're ashamed of, of their own voice and what they have to say. They worry other people will judge them. So there are things that as INFJ as Soda is not there to express. And instead they switch to this listener reporter style. They start interrogating other people or rather they start asking other people questions. So how are you doing? They're constantly putting everything on your side. They're constantly deflecting attention to you from themselves because they are ashamed to some extent. They don't want to be seen. They don't want other people to notice them because INFJs fear uh, being branded as outsiders. They fear becoming outcasts in a sense. And for the INFJ so, it's very important to fit in. They're trying to defend themselves and they're trying to defend their status in the community. The INFJ is sex. This is the INFJ in love. When an INFJ is in love, they tend to idealize. And that's the thing about love. In love, we all idealize. And so in the first stages in a relationship or when you get to know someone, you really find it to be fascinating and meaningful. INFJs tend to keep this reporter style. They tend to keep attention off themselves in this relationship. They swarmed out a person with questions. So who are you? What are you doing? What's this? What's behind that? The INFJ in the SX role is kind of a person, a counselor. They're trying to counsel you all the time. They're trying to understand you, to read you. And to be around an INFJ SX can be a bit overwhelming because they really read you. They're really constantly reading everything you do. They're constantly trying to help you, to heal you in a sense. They're trying to be a support. And to be a support, they tend to, they tend to switch into this style of... Uh, constantly keeping all attention on you. The INFJ SX is also constantly kind of touching you and grabbing you and getting your attention in different ways. They're, in the, they're doing all kinds of things to show and comfort you and to be around you in a sense. The INFJ SP is mainly concerned with their own health and well-being. They're concerned with overall the health and the well-being of everyone. This is the INFJ inclined to work towards maintaining harmony. They are, this is the INFJ trying to oversee the natural flow of the world. This INFJ has a good grasp of how the world works. They understand the ins and outs of their world, of where they live or of the planet they're on and of the people they serve. And they are, in many ways, they are not trying to change anything. They're not trying to fix anything. They're merely trying to preserve this harmony to heal when something is disharmonious, to preserve what is, to maintain what is, what has been created, what exists. And when you're acting purely out of preserving harmony, what you do is you tend to engage in and to be in this constant state of philosophical thinking. You tend to be like a chess player, constantly looking at how things are working, constantly going over theory, rehearsing theory over and over. You tend to be looking at what matters and what's going on and you tend to look at and counsel other people and to counsel the world. You act like a counselor, a person that guides and uh, sees and looks at why things are going wrong. If something has been disrupted, the INFJ as a as P type, as a magician, will tend to come in and go, so why did this happen? What made this happen? What made this disharmony come up? And the hope is they will bring up information or insight that will all solve this difference harmony and return things to balance. The INFJ5 is the INFJ channeling their sage, their inner ego. And the INFJ here is someone that is trying to maintain their center, to avoid being shaken up by things, to avoid being thrown into something that will discomfort them. And the difficult thing for the five is managing these situations that bring them outside their comfort zone. Where the three wants to constantly go outside their comfort zone, the INFJ5 wants nothing <laughs> with to do with going outside the comfort zone. They believe in and they go and retreat to the comfort zone to an area of knowledge and expertise, an area where they feel comfortable. And this is what makes the five somewhat less philosophical. The five is attached to something they are really expectful in. They're really good at something. They have the subject they know everything about. They have this game or this topic that they are really good at. And that's all they want to do. That's all they care about. And that's where they find power. They believe that I cannot find power and energy around other people. I can't... Uh, 
work at, on myself and what I have and my problems. And INFJ5 is really aware of their problems. They're really self-critical. They're usually very harsh on themselves. And they're in this mode where they look at themselves as kind of broken robots or damaged goods. And in this stage, as they're playing video games or as they're kind of distracting themselves and uh, they're kind of working on small flaws and they're thinking about their flaws and all their issues and going over and making and thinking about, oh, this is my issue and this is my issue and this is my problem. This is a problem with me. And this is and they're constantly in this process of self-diagnosis. The INFJ6 is also very inclined to diagnosis, constant self-diagnosis. How am I doing? Is, uh, am I doing things good? Am I doing things correctly? They are also quite self-critical and they are also quite inclined to perfectionism in a sense that they are constantly looking at themselves and what they do and their flaws and what they could do better. They're looking at why they aren't as good as they need to be. They're looking at what they need to do to find power and energy. And this INFJ feels they have no power. They don't trust their own voice. They hold their own voice back because they fear that it is damaged. And just like the five, in a sense, the six is trying to keep this back. However, this is an INFJ of uh, high intuition. This is an INFJ that has this ability to, has this area of expertise, of this intuitive awareness. They have this, um, and they pursue this, uh, uh, they pursue new information and new awareness. They're constantly going over new theories. They're constantly looking at things from new perspectives. They're constantly theorizing and philosophizing about the world. The INFJ6 is best described as a seeker, someone who is searching for the answer to some kind of problem. And this problem keeps on existing because they are constantly in this mode of diagnosis and they keep finding new problems. When an INFJ channels the 7, they switch into this INTJ style where they start planning out trips and planning out journeys, theorizing and speculating on how a journey might go and what might happen. The INFJ might be thinking about if I went on this journey, how would I get there? What would I do to get there? What would I have to plan? What would I need to fix? What would I need to do to make it happen? When an INFJ gets an idea or an, a, a dream in a sense, they are usually very, very practical about this in a sense that they want it to be realistic. They want to find a realistic way to make this dream reality. And that's why they tap so highly on thinking and judging. They start using and employing rules and strategies and they start uh, strategizing uh, to find a way to make these things work. When INFJ steps into the shoes of an 8, of a ruler type, what tends to happen is they tend to become a lot more interpersonal. They believe they need to be engaging for other people. They need to be good at the game, at the social game. They need to connect the network and gain friends everywhere they go. They have to constantly speak to everyone they see. They have to constantly take every new opportunity to network, to connect with other people and to make new bonds and relations. The INFJ in the 8 is trying to to many extent, to, uh, to much extent, uh, channel this idea of uh, the social king or the social ruler, the loved ruler, the person that has the love and the uh, friendship of the people. They are trying to befriend the people they work for. They are trying to be the friends of the people in their workplace. They are trying to be the friends of the people who work under them. They try to be known as the social, friendly, fun, popular. <laughs> uh, ruler. Now the INFJ9 is uh, primarily oriented by being open and remaining intuitive. This is the most intuitive of all INFJs and they are trying to maintain their, their awareness. Awareness of every new opportunity, awareness of every possible change, awareness of everything that could constantly be changed. The INFJ9 is in this mode of constant adjusting and fine-tuning, new theory, new idea, new idea, new idea, and new ways to do the idea, new way to do the idea. This is a state of perpetual confusion because the ideas, their intuition is overstimulated. The INFJ9 has this ENTP style in how they explore ideas. They are like the Vinces, they are like people that are in many ways uh, looking at and constantly diagnosing how the world works. They're constantly diagnosing how am I doing in this? How am I doing in that? How, what problems exist? What, they're constantly aware of dissonance and incongruity and 
the INFJ9 is always trying to fix this incongruity. They're always trying to overlap and fix together and patch together all their theories and all their ideas together. They're highly creative, but their ideas and their intuition is never really stable enough to become actual theory, to become an actual hypothesis. It tends to remain as this uh, just overarching, new, changing, constantly changing idea. And for a long time when I was in the nine, I feel like I was constantly altering my projects, going things over, over and over again, and never settling anything for sure. As an INFJ, I felt that my key challenges have been for the last few years to really integrate my feeling function, my feeling nature, to become more in tune with my emotions and what I find meaningful. And you might have seen and noticed this, how I sometimes wonder what the meaning of and the purpose of what I do is. How I find myself wondering about the value of what I do. How I find myself wondering about how to use my theories for the better good of everyone. How to do and have a positive impact on other people. As I study the Enneagram, I'm increasingly aware of how none of the Enneagram types really match who an INFJ is. And none of the INFJs that are stuck or attached to one Enneagram type will be, can be considered individuated. Because there are blocks, there are things in a way that keep us from self-realization. And I've been thinking lately that perhaps my next challenge should be to create an INFJ handbook. A handbook where I take all this theory and when I put it to practice, when I show an INFJ how to manage different situations such as love, such as leadership, such as success. How to relate to things like materialism, how to relate to things such as relations and bonds, connections. How the INFJ fits with the different personality types. How the INFJ can remain balanced and remain in touch with their center. How the INFJ can protect their individuality and who they are. Yeah, I feel like that could be a good starting point to really digging into a person and into a way of being and into understanding something that I for a long time felt I had no clue about who I was, where I was going in life, how I would get there and how I would manage being something such as an INFJ in this world.